thanks for the intro, Deb, and thank you, Susie and Kath, for putting together a great um, TED today. And thank you guys all for coming out. I have a, um, a pretty simple idea I'd like to share with you today. Um, uh, it's something I've been working on, really, my whole life, um, as we're about to see. And um, only in the last um, two years, the last year specifically, has it come to fruition. So um, what I'd hopefully going to do today is take you on a little journey to um, a specific part of our food system and uh, my experience with it and where I've been and <clears throat> where I'm at now and hopefully um, where this idea is heading. Um, and it seems to be the theme um, with food systems these days uh, that um, my idea reverts back to a revival of the way things um, had historically been done uh, before, specifically in this country, we grew this kind of big, toxic food system that we all now um, deal with on a daily basis. Um, I grew up um, in New York and fished, not this area, <laughs> this area. This area from Cape May to uh, Montauk, New York, is known as the New York, New Jersey Bite. It's not named that because of the uh, tenacity of the fish in that region. It's uh, got to do with the topography of the uh, ocean floor. And it's one of the most diverse um, underwater seascapes uh, on our coast. We've got everything from inshore, offshore, canyons, um, and a very broad and diverse um, fish species. And um, I've really fished for all of them at this stage of the game, surf casting, um, <laughs> trolling. I first I fished recreationally, commercially, um, and inshore, offshore. Um, my passion, since I was a young boy, my parents say I learned to walk and talk and fish all kind of in the same um, <laughs> vicinity there, and they would send me to basketball camp. I would come home with the best fisherman trophy. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And by the eighth grade, I had sworn off uh, I only ate fish. They said that was a real problem for them. Um, uh, but I was devout. I was um, in marine biology in high school. I became really like a fish kind of nerd. I guess we're supposed to go this way. You can see I have a calculator watch on. If anyone remembers those, that's a real sign of a fish nerd. But this is offshore canyon fishing at a very early age. At the age of 13, <coughs> I was hooked on fishing, inshore, offshore, and I really f knew my passion, my calling in life from a very early age. And um, my friends, my family all knew if there was a question of where was Sean, <laughs> he was out um, fishing. And for the last 25 or more years, I've had pretty decent success with fishing, and I've always had a catch and share program, either catch and release or catch and share, where what I caught, I would bring home and share with um, friends and family, and same day sourced seafood um, became my kind of forte. So I'm actually obsessed with very fresh fish. And um, so I, I'm, I'm actually a stalker of very fresh <laughs> fish. And um, so, and my happy place where I feel most comfortable and at peace with the world is when I'm at sea, when I'm, or on the ocean or fishing in the water, <laughs> often um, either by myself or with just a couple of buddies or fellow fishermen. And so um, that's where I feel my place in the world is out fishing. And so to be inland today and surrounded by a few hundred land lovers is a little bit of, a, of an adjustment for me. But um, luckily, my other happy place is restaurants. Um, as Deb said, I've had a pretty healthy and somewhat illustrious career in restaurants. and. Um, Interestingly, I think probably was steered towards restaurants. I grew up in my parents' restaurant in New York City and found if you are um, creative about it, you can carve big swaths of time to do what you love. So I think I, looking back, um, my pursuits in the restaurant career allowed me to make my time to go fishing a lot. So it was pretty um, balanced. I was either working the restaurants or I was fishing. And I started to notice this conflict, this conundrum of um, traditional bricks and mortar restaurants and the food that was being served, specifically fish. When I would go to restaurants or even <coughs> um, markets and I would see 
a type of fish that I had been fishing I had caught, and I knew what, they, what that fish looked like, I knew what that fish tasted like, and I knew that fish didn't smell. Um, the fish that I had always caught and shared and ate, same day sourced seafood, didn't have a smell, and it, you know, it was really, um, and what I began to know as fish is what I always knew as fish. So coming in through my restaurant career, I started to notice things that were just not really fish. It had the same label. Um, and so I was plagued with this question of why wouldn't a catch of the day be caught that day? Why weren't, um, <laughs> why <laughs> that simple? Why wouldn't um, same day sort of seafood be available, especially in coastal areas, um, New York and New Jersey? where we have access to ports and um, ample supplies of seafood. So um, I started to really study the law uh, that governed Department of Health, Department of Agriculture. There's a lot of our country has some great um, agencies that oversee um, and make the laws and codes that guide our um, how we have to behave in, um, in restaurants. And the New York City Department of Health is one. They, they're kind of premier. Um, they write a lot of the codes that other cities will then adapt. So, um, so I regularly was dealing with the Department of Health and started to see um, some conflicts with my mission, my goal in life to, at some point, be able to bring people same day source seafood. I encountered a series of things and codes that I realized were gonna make that impossible. This was the greatest example. FIFO is an acronym, stands for first in, first out. And this is a, a law, it's a, it's a health code. Um, and there it is, it's the first rule of storage, um, ensures that older deliveries are used up before newer ones. So it was during a health inspection, I had a health inspector say to me, you know, these racks need to be labeled FIFO. And any food that you're bringing in today has to go to the rear of what's already been here. So <clears throat> right at that moment, I kind of said, whoa. So it's almost impossible, unless I was timing my um, servings and exhausting my inventory every day, to be able to serve a catch of the day that was caught that day, because the law is telling me I have to serve my customers what I've had in storage the longest. So the first that came in, has to be the first to go out. Um, so, conflict, this great part of the story, where I came to realize bricks and mortar in restaurants, it's not gonna be able to happen there. My dream, my mission to someday bring people very fresh fish, same day source fish, was not gonna really be able to happen in a restaurant today. I started looking everywhere for certain models, how could this work, um, and it was on a trip to Spain in San Sebastian. It was in the late 90s. And I came across um, San Sebastian, Spain, uh, this coastal fishing little port town, Basque country. And it was the first time that I actually saw um, Dr. Dish. I witnessed fishermen come in with their skiffs and their wicker baskets and literally <laughs> take their haul, break it into sections and walk it right into the restaurants. Moments later, the chalkboard got wiped and the catch of the day was the catch of the day. So I saw the same qualities and the same um, flavors and the absence of smell, the, sea, the seafood that smelled like the ocean right there in Spain. And I witnessed Dr. Dish actually happening and kind of looked at that and said, why can't we be doing that at home? And what is this, there's a chain of custody basically that exists here um, in the United States, which essentially what I saw here was a chain of custody, which was a fisherman to a restaurateur served to his guests. What happens often in this country is the chain of custody can stretch anywhere from six to 10 to 15 hands. And every step of that way, the chain of custody, the seafood from the fisherman to the port, to the distributor, to the wholesaler, to the resale, it's beginning to lose qualities um, with each set of hands that it touches and raise price. So what we're left with in this country often is a very low quality, very high price um, seafood item. So um, what I witnessed there was dock to dish in about 15 minutes. I saw the fisherman in San Sebastian come to the dock and within about 15 minutes that 
seafood was on our plates. Uh, <clears throat> so I came back home. I started to do pretty intensive research on the state of fisheries here in our country. So um, it turns out, to my delight, the United States has, uh, is recognized as a global leader for sustainable fisheries. We have some of the biggest, strongest um, rebuilt fish stocks in the world. We certainly have the best um, oversight through NOAA and a couple of other agencies that make sure our, our local fish populations are sustainable. So I looked to um, the supply here in the United States and said, okay, we've got plenty of supply. We've got great um, squid, for example. So <clears throat> our squid fishermen, um, I started to look at the chain of custody here and recognized immediately that it was, um, it was bordering on dangerous. What I started to see was things like squid um, taking, being caught in our New York, New Jersey bite, so being hauled here, being landed in Cape May or Montauk, and then being frozen at the dock, but then kind of disappearing, like where did this go? So, and then I would see in our, local, our restaurants local calamari, local squid. So I started to kind of fish around a little bit, <laughs> and I came up with um, some interesting um, discoveries. It turns out our country has developed a system where we export a lot of our harvest, locally harvested seafood to foreign countries where it's processed. And although this squid may come in your restaurant and stay local, it was, it was harvested locally, it was landed locally, it is local squid, uh, what's happening a lot is that it's being sent overseas and certain seafood in this country has a passport that's been stamped through China, through Asia, where it's processed, we lose sight of it, we lose track of it. And then a pretty staggering um, situation has occurred in this country where whether we're exporting and re-importing, the overall number of what we import in this country is 91% of our seafood. So uh, 91 is pretty close to 100. <laughs> and uh, so I began to really say this is a, this is a big, problem. Um, and what can be our solution? So we want to think globally, act locally, and um, I, about two years ago, decided to take a shot. Uh, I went back to Montauk to build my team, and uh, I wanted to restore honesty and transparency and integrity into this chain of custody and, and lower that chain of custody down to the smallest amount of hands possible. So. Back to Montauk I went, where it's a sleepy little fishing village, but it is a fishing village, and <laughs> the people there subscribe to this kind of thinking. Um, it's very much about honesty and transparency. Fishermen know the language, we know it's being landed, we know it's safe, what's healthy, and with the fish that we're eating is essentially what I wanted to make available to my community. So um, I put together my team, I met with, um, and joined forces with the Concerned Citizens of Montauk Association, the grassroots organization that put me in touch with a great network of local community members um, who were behind the cause. Uh, they wanted to see a new system set up. And that got the attention of National Fish and Wildlife, who work, now works with CECOM. We're putting together um, an initiative where we're writing a manual <coughs> on how to do what we're doing. Um, and then I went and met with um, two really key figures. One, Scott Chasky at Quail Hill, his friend Hannah. Um, and I learned about how they were doing same-day sourced agriculture, vegetables, and the CSA model. So um, I kind of had this epiphanous moment and the light bulb went on and said, you know, um, is this possible? Can we do um, a membership model for seafood, uh, a CSF? where we have um, <clears throat> a community-supported fishery. And I took a look kind of at the playing field. I, I gathered a lot of inspiration from some farm-to-table characters. Dan Barber, for example, um, was a true inspiration to me. And I said, you know, how can I make the same day sourced? How can I have what's coming off the dock to people's hands in the same day? And, or very close to it. 
And uh, so a marine version of the farm to table is born. I got my buddies, my fishing buddies. We went out and set out to, uh, we got a membership base. Um, we launched Long Island's first community supported fishery. So the way that that works is you buy a membership in our fishery and you get a weekly share of, um, of what we catch. So um, if you take that word community and supported and fishery, um, and you can see <coughs> basically by definition um, what we're doing. And so um, we've essentially taken a demand-based model where menus were printed and um, the venues or markets would demand from the fishermen what was being brought. And we have a supply-based model. So whatever's on the dock that day, just like San Sebastian, is what turns out to be on your menu that night. Uh, so my best time to date, 46 minutes from the dock to, uh, this is Nick and Tony's restaurant out east. Um, and we've got essentially now eight different restaurants. This is the training post that I use that in summary describes exactly what we do. We launched the first community supported fishery in Long Island and we just launched the first restaurant supported fishery in the country uh, that works <coughs> very simply like this. Um, we're a new sustainable fishery program that directly connects Montauk fishermen to Manhattan restaurant members. Um, our fishermen specialize in spear gun and rod and reel harvesting. Um, and dock to dish fish is delivered within 24 hours of when it comes on land. So from the dock to our venues, there's a, it's a catch of the day that was as close as you can get to that was caught that day. Um, and we provide, um, we're proud to offer the freshest local sustainable fish allowed by law. So we now have 36 captains. Um, we had 90 members last season. We have a wait list of about 300 right now. Uh, we have eight restaurants and we have one simple message. Um, always seek your source. We want to have a disruption in that chain of custody uh, and specifically in, in seafood. <coughs> um, it seems our theme, our motto is to know your fishermen. The closer you can get to knowing the source of where your food is coming from, the healthier that you'll be and the better your product will be. So know your fishermen is our uh, as our takeaway message for today. And um, I'm Sean from Dr. Dish. We serve very fresh fish. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> <laughs>